The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You are now tuned in to the PA Power Podcast, College Edition, featuring Mason Beckman and Tristan Warner. PA Power Wrestling. PA Power Wrestling. Pennsylvania is wrestling. Wrestling fans, you are now dialed in to the PA Power College Podcast. As Jason Bryan of the Matt Talk Podcast Network said, I'm Tristan Warner, joined by my main man, Mason Beckman, as always. Mason, how are we doing today, man? We're good, man. Just living the dream out here about yourself. Not a whole lot. Uh, it feels like a few a few weeks since we've been uh, recording our, our next podcast, but we're ready to go. Hard to believe it's episode five already. We're really rolling with this thing. I know. Well, if you weren't gallivanting all about the Midwestern United States, maybe we would be on like episode six or seven by now. But hey, you know, you know your priorities are what they are, Tristan. Yeah, you know, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> say, uh, being a Pennsylvania guy through and through, um, you know, like I, like I've said in my previous episodes, you know, being an Old Dominion, we have a lot of guys from the Midwest, and I catch so much flack for being from Pennsylvania. Everyone always talking up the Midwest and talking up their states, and you know, I always brush to the side, but. Uh, I was in Wisconsin for the last five days celebrating uh, one of my best friend's weddings, and that was one of the most fun weekends I've ever had in my entire life, and Wisconsin is an awesome state. It reminded me of being home, actually, in PA. The, the rolling hills, the, uh, the outdoor, the scenery, the you know just everything there just reminded me. The people were great, nice and friendly and funny. Um, hats off to Wisconsin. Uh, maybe I got to go see more of the country and and soak it all in before I can uh, officially claim Pennsylvania as the best state. Yeah, I tell you what, I mean, you kind of said it, but I've been pretty lucky with the places I've gotten to go through running camps and different wrestling or just general life things. Biggest thing, and you talked about like doing that road trip with your best friends for one of your best friends' wedding and everything. If you go, like, no matter where it is, no matter what you're doing, good people make it. If you're surrounded by good people, it's going to be a ton of fun. You know, one people my, make the place. People yep. make the place, man. You know, one of my best friends in life, uh, Caleb Cole, who I mean, he was a uh, Pennsylvania State champ in high school, wrestled out at Nebraska, Grove City. Yeah, yeah. So, Grove City, yep. Yeah, so Caleb um, still lives and works out in Lincoln, and I've been out there to visit him a couple times. And um, and Lincoln's a really, really fun place. You ever get a chance? Especially, I still got to get out there for a game day, but for a football game day, because I've heard that's just insanity. But, you know, it's not like Lincoln, Nebraska is the most happening place on planet Earth. But, you know, going out there, hanging out with some of my best friends, it's a blast. It's like you said, wherever you go, you don't have to have a ton of things to do in the place. I mean, you think of Wisconsin, I didn't really think there would be a whole lot to do, but uh, it didn't even really matter. Like you said, if you're surrounded by good company, it's a good time. Yeah. Uh, I Actually, I ran a camp up in Wisconsin one time. I got to take a tour of Lambeau Field. That place was cool. Um, Green Bay, Wisconsin, is it's the most bizarre place I've ever been, just in the sense that it's literally a small town. It's not even a city. It's just that has an like, NFL franchise. It, it's literally like you, you're driving down a street. I don't know the name of it, but you're driving down a street, and you just have normal residential homes on your right and Lambeau Field on your left. Like, right directly across the street. It's It really is kind of crazy. That said, um, before we completely derail right off the bat. We're still uh, PA power. Remember that. We're still PA power. Yeah. But, hey, having said that, get yourself out if you get a chance. Do some traveling. And just show yourself and everyone else that PA is the best place in America. I just wanted to clarify that before Jeff fires us before episode six. So, we're still PA power. Hey, you were the one that was going all these places the last week. So. Uh, I know, I, I know. I had to <laughs> had to save myself there. So anyway, uh, the only real correction or addition we have from last week's episode was the fact that we talked about the best guys at Never All-American, and we didn't mean to disrespect anybody by leaving them off the list. We could have talked about the best guys at Never All-American for the entirety of every episode so far. The list is so long with worthy candidates. Um that we kind of just left it to guys that we personally knew or distinctly remembered. So obviously, you know, the last, from 2000 forward, Tristan and I are going to remember more, you know, 
because of our age, you know, I'm 24, you're what, 25, 26. Um, yeah. So we didn't mean to, you know, we didn't intentionally leave anybody off that list or didn't mean any disrespect. So I'm sure there's a ton of people that got left off, got left out of our podcast last week that are more than deserving of it. You know, I know just from talking to Jim Rakerly, you know, the guy I coach with at Quest and other friends, you know, my dad and my brother, the names that they brought up. I can't tell you how many times this past week I've been like, man, that would have that would have been a good name to bring up. You know what I mean? So no disrespect to anybody that got left off that list. As far as I know, at least at the time we're recording this, no real big recruiting or transfer news. Um, Nick Suriano, they're still – there's an update in the fact that there's not an update with Suriano. So nothing has happened with Suriano, which is important to note because as of right now – you Penn know, State again, doesn't have a 125 pounder. Well, certainly not one the caliber of Soriano. <laughs> but beyond that, classes start in a few days at Penn State. The, the The deadline to register for classes is August 20th. It's Sunday. So first day of class is Monday, August 21st. Yeah. So in Rutgers, is a couple weeks after that. The first day of class is September 5th, I believe. So you got to believe, at least I would think, right? If if Suriano isn't registered by Sunday and walking around in State College on Monday, by default, does that mean he's going to Rutgers because he's not enrolled at Penn State? Because it seems like a I would, it seems like a binary thing, right? I would say more so than I would say he's going to Rutgers. I would more definitively say he's not going to Penn State. Um, as soon as the, we heard these rumors and the, you know they came to they came to. Uh, fruition that it was looking like a legitimate case that he was not going to be at Penn State next year and then all these articles came out about um you know uh him trying to get a waiver to leave and I saw an article about how his family was saying this wasn't a good fit for him like people were trying to speculate as to what the reason was and something about you know his family said it it was more just that it wasn't a good fit for him aka I think he's more just he's a Jersey guy he wants to be in Jersey homesick whatever it might be but um yeah I think I think at this point he's off the roster I think it's it's pretty black and white that he's not going to be at Penn State unless unless this is just an elaborate, um, I don't know, plan for uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't know where I'm going I mean, with this. Help me out. <laughs> uh, I mean – What is it? Man, leverage. Leverage. What, what, yeah, like I, I was just going to say leverage for something. It's but- like a job, like when you're you're – you know, throwing it out there that you might be leaving your job, but, you know, you're trying to get more money from your other job, you know, one of those type things. But I, I can't imagine that Suriano is not getting a pretty penny and getting taken care of at Penn State. So, I mean, it, it looks to me like he won't be at Penn State. You have to think Rutgers is the number one candidate for him to go. But like we talked about last episode, if if because of the whole Big Ten in-conference transfer thing blocks him, makes him lose a year of eligibility, then who knows? You could end up somewhere else. But I don't think he'll be at Penn State next year at this point. All signs – point to the fact that he won't be at Penn State and who knows that may change in the coming days but with what we know now with what has and has not happened it all like you said all signs kind of point to him being elsewhere for the coming season so yeah. um beyond that you know those are really the only recruiting transfer things we have going on apparently so your brother made me aware of something astounding that happened within your family during the, the recording of our last podcast. Oh, God. Where are you going with this one? I'm going with the fact that the lesser-known Warner sibling, one, your sister one Tess. Of two. One of two others. One of two. Okay, fair enough. I didn't know there were two more. I just thought it was you three. <laughs> just coming out of the woodwork, these Warners. You got, Are you guys like the next Rappo family? There's just going to be 20 of you? No, no. We're done after TC, so that's it. <laughs> but anyway, apparently during the last podcast, how do we leave uh, the Rappos off that family discussion? By the way, I know they they never quite achieved the All American status in college, but as a as a wrestling family in Pennsylvania, the Rappos one of the best that come to mind for me in the last twenty years at least. Yeah, I mean, you figure one, two, three. Mark, there Rick, were, Mike, at least those three were those all th- top th- top ten in the country, probably coming out of high school. Um, yeah, there, there was there was Billy, Rick, Mike, Billy was there was Man. there was Rick, Mike, Mark, Matt, Matt, was, and Billy. Matt was the only one who didn't win a state title, but even he was a couple time placer. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Matt, you're right. He is the only one that didn't win a state title, and 
that's not meant to be a knock on Matt Rappo. Matt had a great career between Council Rock South and then Bloom, right? Imagine being a father and and your goal is for your goal in life is to have your son win a state title, and you have five kids and four of them win state titles, and a couple of them won multiple. That's a successful family right there. From a high school standpoint, it's hard to imagine a more successful Pennsylvania high school family than than the Rappos. Exactly. So, I mean, hey, there's another correction we can throw in there as far as, you know, things that we've left off in recent weeks. Um, but to get back, it to the list. To get back to my original point, wanted to give a shout out to Tristan's older sister, Tess Warner. Apparently, her nectarine eating skills are top notch. Yeah, so I was recording the last podcast, and me and Mason were deep into some rant about God knows what, and my brother walks down the stairs <laughs> in the middle of the podcast while I'm talking. I'm surprised it didn't come through the speaker in the background to, uh, you know, he came rushing down like there was some big news. I'm, I'm getting worried for a second, and he just lets me know that my sister just ate a nectarine. Um, so there's that. <laughs> Not really anything else that can be said. You can't make it up. That's just a day in the life in the Warner household, I guess. Family, man. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so 49 next year. A lot of really good dudes on this list. Who Who's your mind go to when you go to 149? Hmm. Zane Rutherford? He's not bad. He's all right. He's decent. Yeah, I'll, so. He'll probably start for Penn State this year, I'm thinking. That's questionable. Yeah, it really all is, though. Yeah, it was <laughs> Yeah. So obviously the list begins and ends with Zane Rutherford, who's just very, very good at wrestling. There's not really any other way to put it. Um, back to back undefeated seasons and national titles. Um, he has just, he's bonused everybody at the national tournament the last two years, right? I think so, yeah. It, this year was just destruction. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, did he tech Maze? Yeah, he teched him. Tech Maze, pin, yeah. Then uh, he didn't have a pin Sorensen in the first period. Sorensen, he, he tech. Uh, he didn't have a South Dakota State kid in the quarters, and then from behind that, I think it was all text too. He didn't have a match go seven minutes in the national tournament. That is absolutely absurd. And that's why he won the Hodge. Yeah, there was a lot of good candidates so, this year for the Hodge, but I mean, obviously, you can't not give it to Zane. No, the I mean, the only other guy I would have said would have been Snyder, and I think. The only – the thing with Snyder was just um, – well, you could have said Nolf too. Jaden Cox. I mean, Nickel beating Gabe Dean. Yeah. There's just yeah. Mark Hall, well, but Nickel freshman. Ha- I mean, not necessarily these guys the most dominant, which is I guess what the Hodge is really supposed to be modeled after. But I yeah. mean, if you just look at I how mean, many guys were – just so many good guys this year. So many guys that just stood out in their weight, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, there were – all 10 weights had an undefeated guy going to Nationals. Exactly. You got Dean Heil, too, undefeated two-timer now. I mean, yeah, he's he's not dominating score-wise, but it's pretty hard to beat that guy. Again, he's he's pretty good at the sport of wrestling. Uh, so past Zane, you know, not to spend forever and beat a dead horse. We all know Zane. Past him, you've got – so probably the – oh, actually, the next the next guy you got to talk about, Solomon Trisco. Two-time All-American, you know, he's got two years left at Virginia Tech. He's a Cannon McMillan graduate, you know, so he's a Western, Southwestern Pennsylvania native. Um, six twice, I believe, right, for Chishko? Yeah, Solly has been six twice, and I got to tell you. That's moving he, up the weight class, too, and it's from his freshman to his sophomore year up to 49. Yeah, dude, he is, he's one of the just most freakish human beings I've ever rolled around with. So Solomon – you know, grew up in the same club that I did at, at Quest, you know, where I coach now. And I'll never forget the first time I worked out with Solly. I was a junior in high school. Our group of three was myself, Anthony Zanetta. I was a junior in high school. Um, I don't remember what point during the year this was, but that was the year I won my first state title. Anthony Zanetta, who was on his way to winning his second EWL title and, um, you know, qualify for nationals for the second time in as many tries as a true sophomore. And Solomon, who I think was an eighth grader. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't even in high school. Was an eighth grader. If you would have sat there from the outside, uh, not knowing who any, not knowing any one of the three of us, 
and said, okay, there's one junior high kid, one high school kid, one college kid, you would have had no idea which was which. That's how – I mean that's how much of a – I think I would have known that you were the junior high kid. But aside from that, well, between well, Zanetta okay. and Shishko, I wouldn't have known which one was the college kid. You're right. The fact that I look like I'm 12. <laughs> but Be honest. I, I mean, probably felt the wrath of Chishko's blast double even when he was in eighth grade at least once. Uh, see, his double was always really good. But when he, you know, when he was in – when he was still that young, um, he hadn't completely gotten the power behind it now. I mean, he did for his age group, but, you know, from 13, 14 years old to 17 to 20, you know, that's a huge maturity gap. But the thing about Sully that was always so freakish was he was always really strong. And if you've ever watched me, you know how flexible he is. He's one of those dudes that's every bit as strong and a complete split as he is standing there, you know, compact in a stance. Which isn't supposed um, to happen. No, he's, uh, you know, he's got. He's got some secrets to share with the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, and he's got all ears. He's got hands like almost AJ Shop like hands, with big clamps for hands. Kids, he's just tough, and he's so he's super super hard to wrestle. And, and I mean, again, they got kids a two time All American, so he's proven himself time and time again. A couple so, other but, Pittsburgh guys on this list too, by the way. Yeah, yeah, Pittsburgh so, is well represented at one forty nine for for next year. Absolutely. So those two guys being Josh Maruka out at Arizona State, who last year's a freshman. Won the Pac-12, was two and two at the national tournament. One of those wins ended Anthony Colico's career, so that's a high level win. The yeah, other guy, Colico, two seed, went down in the second round to Kenny Theobald from Rutgers, and then dropped down. I think he lost to Maruka right away. What what happened to Colico out there? That's the question that I was wondering. Uh, dude, it's like what we talked about last week. Um, Must have been banged up, or yeah, like oh. we were. Well, I think I did hear something about Colica had dealt with like a mild concussion or something at NCAA's. But again, the national tournament, especially a guy senior year as a two seed, it can get to you. You know, yep. and, that, and that match against Theobald, you can kind of see as that match plays on, Colica's the two and Theobald's the 15 seed, right? So as that match progresses, Colica being the two seed, a match that he's supposed to blow the doors off of that guy, you know, as time continues to roll and that match stays tight the whole time, it's working in Colica's head like this isn't supposed to be happening this way. And it's working in Theobald's head that, Hey, we're in this match all, you know, he's really put himself in a position to win. So uh, again, I do think that I heard Colica was dealing with injuries at the national tournament but, I mean, who knows? And then dropping down into Maruka, number one, a horrible guy to fall into if you're Colica. You know, you you work your entire career to put yourself in a position to win a national title. He had had the season that showed he was capable of winning a title. I mean, he took Zane to the wire. And then he falls, you know, so that all comes crashing down in the match against Theobald in overtime. And he falls into Maruka. And... I don't rem- I don't remember the ins and outs of that match, but I remember there was a point. You, again, we talked about it last week that you could just s- see in Colica that it was almost like he was ready to be done. Yeah, that's true, and you have to give hats off to uh, to Theobald too. He had a heck of a tournament for a 15 seed. Ended up placing eighth, I think. But he, you know, he all American either way. A couple of those Rutgers guys come to mind, like who have done that recently. I remember Anthony Parati was in my bracket a few times, and. I think both times the All American, he was in a similar position in the bracket, like unseeded or real low seed, and um, just pulled off some big wins here and there, and then f- found himself on the podium. So Rutgers has had a couple of those guys lately, and uh, who knows, Nick Suriano might be might be the next guy in this in the Scarlet Knight singlet. Yeah, I mean it's, it's very possible. So the other Pittsburgh native is Sammy Crevis, who's down at the University of Virginia national qualifier last year. Um, he was all world coming out of high school. He's like the number one kid in, in the country coming out of high school, if I remember right. So, you know, Maruka, Crevis, and Chisco, all three Pittsburgh area natives. So the Whippio well represented that. Past them, we have Kyle Shoup, who was a national qualifier at Lockhaven. Joe Oliva at Penn, who was, you know, going to be a senior. He's been a captain there a couple times. A guy that's just always been solid for the Quakers. You know, never really had that one win that knocks your socks off, but 
again, has just been very steady, always beats the guys he's supposed to beat, and kind of, you know, you don't necessarily want to say it, but loses the matches he quote-unquote should lose. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe that's a guy there that a coaching change will really benefit. You know, some guys react very positively to coaching changes, others not so much. So, you know, that's a guy there that has done well enough his entire career that with a coaching change you could see him – you know, making a jump, getting himself to the national tournament and doing some damage. So, Yeah, uh, just to go back to Sammy Krebus for a moment, and hopefully our fans can still hear me as my cat just jumped up on my desk and literally swatted my microphone. So let's hope everyone can still hear me. Um, <laughs> Krebus, is there is there any possibility that you think he'll drop down to 41 um, this coming year? I feel like he came out of high school at like 32 or something like that. And I was thinking he was going to be a 33 or 41 pounder at the most in college. And then he was obviously kind of stuck with DiCamillo being at 41, who was an NCAA finalist this year. Um, and then now DiCamillo is done. So do you think there's any possibility? And, uh, well, Mickey Phillippe also just transferred out back to Pitt. So, I mean, is there any possibility you see Crevis making a drop to 41? He didn't look like too big of a 49 pounder to me. I don't, I mean, I don't know Sammy at all, but... Number one, I agree with the fact I don't think he looked like a huge 49. With DiCamillo leaving, I definitely think it's possible. I mean, he was yeah. tough at 49, but, I mean, it almost felt like, compared to the accolades he came out with high school, um, it almost felt like he was a little undersized for the weight at 49, and maybe that contributed to – I mean, he definitely had a standout season as, what, a redshirt freshman. But, um, yeah, like you said, this guy coming out of high school was like a guy, you know, could be on the podium as a true freshman, that that type of caliber, so – wondering if we see him drop to 41 and he gets to his natural weight and look out. Yeah, he, like you said, maybe dropping to 41. Or, I mean, hey, who knows? Maybe just – because he was a retro freshman last year, right? That's what I think so, yep. Those first few years, they're hard, man. You know, the first – They time, are. Especially that first full year in the lineup and everything. There's a lot of – I mean, you hear it all the time. Some guys – it takes guys different amounts of time to figure it out, and it's – if you've never gone through it, there's no other way to explain it other than just eventually some guys just figure it out. Yeah, you know? and and I think your discussion about Jared King last episode uh, alluded to a really good point too. Like, think about how many guys you know we talked about in one of the episodes about best guys to never all American or best guys to never win a title. Um, you think about these guys came out with different levels of um, credentials coming out of high school, but so many guys that go to college and like. Even if whether they just completely drop off the face of the earth or they maybe still have a solid career but still underachieve a little bit or whatever it is, the case may be, people really don't, you know, the fans don't really know the circumstances of what goes on. Like your story about Jared King, you know, until you said all of that and you knew all those background details, I always just thought Jared King, um, you know, was incredible coming out of high school. And I thought, you know, he just kind of had a, a decent but not great college career for whatever reason. And then somehow put it all together for one tournament at the NCAAs. But little did I know, you, you talked about three or four surgeries he had, staph infections, like illnesses. People don't know these things. So I don't know. As Since I've graduated college and since I've you know become more of like on the media side and more of a spectator, I really take those things into account now, thinking about these guys. Like it's not – you don't just show up in college and you're either amazing or you're not. Like there's so much that goes into it and so many um, events that happen in the meantime – uh, in so many different ways, injuries or, you know, personal things happen or illnesses, whatever it may be that affect these guys. So I don't know. That's just, that's just my two cents, but that's not to get on Crevis at all. He's, he's really young and he's going to be amazing. I think, um, I'm just, I'm just curious if he you know, maybe dropped the 41 and, and like that puts him right in the mix for, you know, all American status right there. If he's, if he's down a weight and he's, you know, living up to the hype that he came out of high school with. Yeah, and I mean, again, the talent's there. The wrestling is there. That's none of that is in question. So, you know, maybe it's a weight change. Maybe it's just another year under the belt. But Sammy Crevis is a dude that he's gonna be fine. Yeah, he, no he's gonna be he's gonna be just fine. UVA has been churning out studs, especially a lot of PA kids and a lot of Pittsburgh area kids in the last decade. So, I mean, he's just gonna be one added to the list. Yeah, and I mean, they've had guys competing at a very high level. The last few, you know, consistently the last few years with Soldier, obviously you had, you know, Matt Snyder never got himself on the podium, but Matt Snyder was always in the mix, you know, around the twelve. There's another guy you could have met. We could have mentioned for best cast never all American. Matt Snyder was always in the mix for UVA. 
as a Lewistown native. We threw Spizak on that list, and then the Spizak. Nelson twins, I think, uh, yep. might have eventually got on the podium. No, neither one of them did. Nick had, uh, I want to say, cancer or something. He, he fought some... So that was Matt. So Nick, like you said, the you know twins that Shaler natives. Uh, Nick won a state title in high school, but their senior year, I believe it was, because again, uh, they were Quest kids. So yep. We all used to work out. This was my seventh or eighth grade year. Would have been, I think, my eighth grade year. But every Sunday, this was back when Duquesne still had a program, or I, they at least still had a wrestling room at the University of Duquesne, right there in, in Oakland, in Pittsburgh. And on Sundays, instead of having practice down at the club in Cannonsburg, we used to have practice at Duquesne because it was more central for everybody, for the guys like my brother and I coming from the north. So the whole postseason, we would have practices at Duquesne. And I remember one one Sunday, Nick and Mr. Nelson were talking about Matt had a concussion. And Matt was always the one. You ever You ever see sometimes with twins, there's like, one that is perpetually never hurt, and then there's one that's always kind of something's banged up. With the Nelson twins, Nick was like, could have thrown him through a brick wall, and he would have come out the other side just fine. You know, and Matt just had the worst luck on earth with injuries. But anyway, they were wrestling in practice the week prior, and they both shot at the same time, and they just kind of hit heads. Nick stood up and was totally fine, and Matt had a concussion. He dealt with this for years. You know, he went to, so he goes to UVA. Him and Nick would, I mean, they would stay up all night studying for a test, and Matt would wait, you know, get two hours of sleep, go to the exam. I mean, there were some nights they literally, they would study the whole way up until Matt would have to walk over to class for his exam. And Matt would walk to class and literally completely forget everything. So he dealt with real bad you know, post-concussion effects and all these other things. But he finally got himself healthy for one last run. I think he was actually a sixth-year senior. He got a medical redshirt out of it. So, I mean, but that's another guy you talked about. You mentioned things you don't know that go on and underlying reasons why guys' careers don't play out the way they quote-unquote should have. Yeah, um, and Nelson's were, like you said, they were maybe not all world, like you said, but I mean, they were studs coming out of high school, like nationally ranked top guys, state champs, state placers. And uh, yeah, until that article came out, I remember they did write an article. Um, I'm friends with a couple guys who went to UVA, so I saw them sharing it. But if I didn't catch that, I would have never known that until you just told that story. So yeah, um, a lot of times you don't, you don't really know what goes on in those guys' careers, but um, nevertheless, that's, yeah, we got off on a little rant there, but 49 so, stack for next year. There's there's a lot of tough kids and one noticeable departure as well. Yeah, so Pat Lugo, who was a national qualifier, who was like the 7 or 8 seed for Edinburgh last year, has transferred to Iowa, right? Iowa. I think he's going to redshirt so, too. I don't think he got his release. Okay. Well, which I have no idea why Lugo left. Um, it seemed like a silly decision to leave that program as far as – and you talk about workout partners that Lugo would have had. He's got Austin Matthews, a weight above him, or no, two weights above him because Austin's at 65 now, who's a three-time national qualifier. You got Cliff Moore, who won a national title at 133 in his time in college at Iowa. You've got Mitchell Port, who we talked about is arguably one of the, you know, best guys to never win himself a title. He's a two-time national finalist. Did Cliff Moore win it at 33 or 41? 33 because he beat Josh Bourne finals i do believe. I think believe. zach roberson beat josh Moore in the finals i think scott oh yes you're Cliff right beat scott in the semis because i remember scott he looked like he hit his head or something like he he looked dizzy and like i don't know i thought he was gonna win that match and i remember ended up getting like majored so i if you just watch the match it looked like scott was like out of it i remember you know i was a big Moore fan so i remember watching that match and thinking like scott just looked like he hit his head or something i remember cliff moore ended up like majoring him and i think scott had beaten cliff moore before but anyway, I think Cliff Moore went on to win it in the finals at 41. I can't tell you who he beat. I want to say like, well, I I, to I say got like it. Josh Chirella, but that's probably wrong. No, I got it right here in front of me. Uh, he won at 141, you're right, in 2004. He beat Matt Murray out of Nebraska, not the Pittsburgh okay. Penguins goalie. So yeah, Lugo has departed, is heading to Iowa, a decision that, again, I don't completely understand from a workout partner standpoint, but... Again, I'm sure there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. 
What I will say is this about Lugo. One of the things that he had going for him in the Edinburgh singlet, which their singlets are, are awesome. Lugo, um, talk about Lugo here. He, le- he alludes to, he foreshadows, I guess we'll say, to two topics that we're going to talk about. Actually, maybe three if you count Edinburgh preview. But go ahead. Yeah, so Edinburgh has – they've done a great job. I think one of the smartest marketing ploys that anybody has kind of put in with their program in recent years. You know, you got to stand out, and especially in this day and age with how much high school kids, you know, with recruiting ploys, they love the gear, they love the flash and all this other stuff. So Edinburgh, what's different for them? Plaid, right? They're the Fighting Scots. Their mat is plaid, which is one of the craziest mats I've ever seen. But it actually doesn't look bad the way they did it because the outskirts of it are plaid and the center of it's black. So if you're going to make something plaid, they did it right. Then they incorporate plaid and some pretty cool designs into their singlets. You know, I think they're still cradle gear. And, um, you know, cradle gear always kind of has these funky, different, unique designs for singlets. You know, at one point I remember I was wrestling AJ Shop in the All-Star Duel. Uh, I think in Philly it was, or maybe it was down in Virginia, because we wrestled that thing twice. But I remember we're halfway through the match, and I get in on a single leg, and I'm trying to finish it. And halfway through this process, I realize that his shoes are also plaid. <laughs> That's what you were looking at when you're trying to finish that single. You would be amazed at some of the head up, what? Mason Beckman. Head up. He was pushing it. Okay, it's not that easy for the record. Um, He's going for his probably shin wizard tilt anyway. He was so hard to finish on. But anyway, um, yeah, they do a lot of cool things with plaid. So their singlets are some of the best in college wrestling. And Lugo, if you've ever seen him wrestle, has this. I think it's it's a full sleeve, I think, on his left arm. But, you know, he's got this sleeve that comes down over, you got comes 50, down 50 over one of his shoulders. Left or right arm. Yeah, and knowing my luck, I'm probably wrong. But... And it's a sleeve that comes down over his shoulder. And I got to say, it's a really well done tattoo. That tattoo combined with their singlets, Lugo had as much, if not more, style than anyone at the national tournament last year. That's funny you say that because uh, for those people who follow me on Twitter, um, I read at the end of the season last year, right after NCAAs, um, if you remember this, I made, a, I made a bracket with the top 16 guys at NCAAs that I thought had the best swag. And uh, it, it was all... Some people might have misinterpreted. I got some hate, some hate uh, DMs and some hate comments, but um, it was based on who had the best gear in terms of singlet, you know, shoes, socks, no ankle socks. I mean, if you had ankle socks, you were done immediately. That's an immediate L. Hey, you have- had to have the chin cup. It had to be, you know, you had to have just the overall look, the overall swag appearance. And I made the 16 man bracket, separated it out. I had a Twitter poll each day that would, you know, clump them in groups of four for voting. Um, Drew Foster from Northern Iowa ended up winning it, and that was largely the, in part to him wearing Crocs on the podium and the uh, Jeff Gordon the, T-shirt. Jeff Gordon T-shirt. Yeah, that's I'll, right. ne- I'll never that's, forget that because I was sitting there. He wrestled because he made the semis, right? Uh, I think quarters. It was at, yeah, it was at least the quarters. quarters. But I was I was sitting it's there Nolan with Nolan uh, Floyd from Oklahoma State, I think. Yeah, I was sitting there with um, with Zach Nybert, a friend of mine at wrestled at Virginia Tech. And we both look up, and I'm like, hey, is that a Jeff Gordon t-shirt? And lo and behold, there's Drew Foster walking around two mats away in a Jeff Gordon t-shirt. Of all the things that you would think you'd see on the, the floor at the national tournament, a Jeff Gordon t-shirt isn't one of them. But I guess if there's a school that you would rock it, it'd be Northern Iowa. I was just going to say, leave it to a guy from Reynolds, Pennsylvania to diagnose the Jeff Gordon t-shirt because he could have been wearing it right in front of my <laughs> face, and I wouldn't have picked up on that. So, up oh, to you. <laughs> what do you? I'm going to know that... I'm going to know the number 24 DuPont car from an entire arena away. Well, not to get sidetracked, but the point of our discussion was, um, so tonight, we, in this episode, we wanted to discuss colleges in Pennsylvania that have the best singlets. Obviously, Edinburgh, the front runner with what we've already told you so far. Next episode, we just thought of this idea off the whim here. Um, we wanted to talk about college wrestlers in Pennsylvania that have the best tattoos. And Mason, we're maybe not fully equipped to have that discussion outside of Pat Lugo right now. But, you know, if our fans hear this and and think of any candidates off the top of their head, feel free to send them to us so we have a more well-rounded discussion for next episode. Well, I was going to say, hit hit us up on social media with your suggestions. 
if you have photo evidence, that would be very helpful. Because that would be great. If it's a dude that has a tattoo that I've never seen and I can't find photo evidence of it, I'm going to think you're trying to catfish me. And like we said, we're trying to stick with Pennsylvania guys here, being the PA Power podcast. But if you got a, a candidate out there who's who's just another college guy from a different team, but it's it's somebody we can't refute that they've got the top tattoo swag, then feel free by all means. We we threw out a couple others here. Crutchmer from Oklahoma State had some good ones. Um, you had another one, Mason, a non PA guy. I forget who it was, but I mean, there was Jo who. Yeah, yeah, one of the goats. Yeah, had uh, the f- tattoos, tattoos of all shapes and sizes. He's pretty much covered in them. You know who had a really, really great tattoo, like very well done. Well, after they graduated, was Dylan Ness. Have yep. you have you seen that whole that whole sleeve he's got now? I don't know if I've seen the whole thing, but I uh, I saw something on Twitter. I think it was not too long ago. He's yeah, also just. I think he's having a kid now too. I saw. So uh-huh. good for him. Interesting. I saw that. I saw that he proposed to his now fiance with a packet of Taco Bell sauce. <laughs> That's classic. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw he put so, a picture on Twitter of the uh, whatever that thing's called, where it's like a black and white picture with like a little, you know, outline of a child. The, the it's an ultrasound. There Just you them. go. That's what it was. <laughs> I told you the Elite Eighty Nine doesn't cover you, uh, doesn't cover real life smarts. Just book smarts. You just don't smarts. know what an ultrasound <laughs> is. Come on, man. Yes, I just don't know what it's called. It's all good. I haven't walked right. on that road yet. So, But anyway, to get back to our point, um, like we said, the tattoo discussion will be next week. Let's finish off with the singlets here. I got Edinburgh, probably the front runner. Besides the plaid, they've got a couple other really good ones. Just red and black is just a classy color scheme. Red, black, and white. They've got a few white singlets. I think Mitchell Port might have worn one in the NCAA finals against Kendrick Maple a few years ago. That was pretty tight. Um like you said, the plaid wrestling man. I mean, you can't beat Edinburgh swag. Um, few teams in the country really can, much less Pennsylvania. A couple others I had on the list. I like Pitts. Um, Pitts got the classy look. I like the yeah. color scheme. They got Nike, which is amazing. I mean, I'm a big Nike guy. Like well, you said, and the- Cradle Gear makes some awesome stuff. I'm a huge Cradle Gear fan too. But and in terms of the big um, sporting goods you know, uh, brands, I'm a Nike all the way. So I like Pitts a lot. Yeah, and the coolest part about the pit ones, well, two things. Number one, they've gone back to the script pit logo as opposed to the block pit. The script pit looks so much better. It is one of the best logos in all of college sports. So the script pit looks awesome. And just being, you know, living in the Pittsburgh area now, you know, being surrounded by pit alum everywhere. um, Pit alum pretty much unanimously are thrilled about the fact that they're back to the script pit and i agree i think it looks awesome the other cool thing about the pit singlets if you're not familiar with pitt's campus the probably the most recognizable thing on their campus is called the cathedral of learning it's this this structure this building in the middle of campus uh and you know that's their hallmark right on the back of their singlets so if the back of pitt singlets if it's the blue and gold one it's that navy blue, and then right about where the shoulder straps come up, you know, with the part where it comes up between your shoulder blades, it turns gold. And in that gold, with the shading, you can see the cathedral. It's so cool. I, I, I agree. I think pits are awesome. Yeah. Pitt, Penn, um, sorry, Pitt, Edinburgh. I said Penn State just because, I mean, their blue and white singlets are, are just, you know, that's what they got. They're classic. But uh, – I like their white singlets that they rarely wear. Sometimes I remember like Bubba Jenkins wore it in the finals that one year. I think maybe Phil Davis theory won it. Rarely see them, but they are cool. They they broke out the pink and black ones at one point this year. I saw Mark Hall had a picture of that. And then I think they also have camo ones, which are pretty cool. And we forgot to mention Edinburgh's camo singlets, by the way. Yeah, so the the Penn State camo ones were for Military Appreciation Night, if I remember correctly, and the black and pink ones were for breast cancer awareness and fundraising. So, not only were they cool singlets, but they were for awesome causes. So, I thought that you know that the singlets themselves are great, but the fact that you know they're raising awareness and doing good things for good causes makes it even better. Yeah, and I think the last team. I threw Lock Haven out there too. I, I'm I like maroon. It's a cool color, and Lock Haven has gotten some better singlets over the years. But off the top of my head, I couldn't think of any one in particular that was um, like that particularly stood out. But uh, 
Lehigh, I will say, brown is an absolutely terrible color. Terrible color. Daisy. Okay. The absolute worst color you could have for a team. I'm just going to say that straight up. It's, it's classy. Um, it's classy. There's nothing classy about the color brown. All my right. Friend. Well, hang on. Um, hang on. Hang on. You were uh, just, uh, you were, I didn't finish my thought. I didn't finish my thought. You though. were just in a wedding. What color shoes did you wear? That would be black. Ah, I had a 50 50 <laughs> shot. <laughs> that would be black. But uh, anyway. Um, so, you get my point. So, so Lehigh's got an absolutely terrible color in brown. But I will say they find a very. they. They have a very good way of hiding the brown. I like their gold, their incorporation of gold and white to kind of mask the hideousness of the brown. They do a great job of that. Um, your guys' gold singlets and all of your singlets that are brown but still have a lot of gold on them are pretty cool. And the white ones are, are all right, I guess. And if you, if you try to ignore the brown, I'll say. So – the, the, first of all, I'm just going to ignore all of the hate about the brown. I have had this argument so many times. I actually have for our – when we graduated, our, the seniors in my year, we got a framed brown Lehigh singlet, and mine's actually hanging up on my wall in my apartment. So – and I mean it's definitely true. You know, you talk about you acquire taste for things. You do come to love that brown and white. I know that sounds insane, but – I love them. I think our singlets look awesome. The ones that they just started wearing this year that there's a brown one and a white one. It's just, you know, the brown one's all brown, just says Lehigh and white on the chest and has a big block stripe down the sides. I think those look as good as any singlet. I'm Me personally, I'm really big on simple. I like simple designs. You know, I think simple and sharp designs are, you know, the best way to go for singlets. Uh, I mean, not that I don't like what, you know, Edinburgh does with their unique and interesting designs. That's just my personality. I like, I'm a simple man, right? The gold singlets though, th- there's actually kind of a funny backstory to those. So the first time the gold singlets were ever broken out, um, well, I actually even go back a little further than that. One of the things you have to understand about Lehigh wrestling and Lehigh people is that with our alum tradition is huge you know tradition is everything to lehigh people right so for i mean decades and decades it was it was just brown and white and our mascot was the engineers so then the university made the decision to update the mascot to mountain hawks because they didn't want us to be just viewed as an engineering school and that was done right around late 90s early 2000s so alumni a lot of our alumni still refer to us as the engineers. They refuse to accept the new mascot, right? So, and with that update, gold became our third color. It went from brown and white to brown white with the alternate being gold. So, the first time they ever broke out the gold singlets was at EIWA's my junior year of high school. And, I mean, you know how it is. Every team has these rounds. They just had a bad round. You know what I mean? Yeah. And all of the alumni were blaming – I shouldn't say all of the alumni, but some of the alumni were literally blaming the the round on those, on the gold singlets. And some of the alumni just – you know, the, the quote-unquote traditionalists hated those singlets. So there's been like this ongoing back and forth between some members of the alumni and I think even some members within the university. And the kid – because like us as athletes, we loved the gold singlets. They were easily our favorite singlets for a lot of us. Any chance we got to wear the gold ones, we would do it. But I don't know how Old Dominion did it. But, you know, you've got your equipment managers that they give you your competition stuff the day of a duel or before you leave for a road trip, right? You don't always have your singlets in your warm-ups. You wear, yeah. them, you wear them to compete. Then you turn them back in. They get wa- they get washed. And, mm-hmm. then, and then you get them back in a competition bag for whenever you compete, right? Yep. So we didn't have, you know, whoever the captains were, like in my time as a captain – Santoro would ask the you know those of us that have been voted captains you know hey what singlet do you guys want to wear and and we would talk amongst the team and a bunch of us always wanted to wear gold and there was actually a time period where like the gold was temporarily banned and then it came I, I saw that it came back a few times this year so I love those singlets but it's it's been quite the adventure trying to wear them yeah two things I'll say to that um, one. It's no matter what the biggest thing I've found is no matter what kind of singlet or gear you come out with, 
some people are going to love it and some people are going to hate it. I mean, if you think about those Edinburgh singles we were just talking about, I remember when they came out, I was sitting there like jaw wide open at how cool they were. And I just heard a bunch of people I was with, all mostly older people, talking about how hideous they were and how oh, too much design, too too much this, too much that. I also remember when Oklahoma State, you know, for years, they were just the orange singlet. That's all it was until probably like, I don't know, I want to, be, I want to say it was around – Chris Perry's like junior year, they came out with those black and silver ones that had a little bit of orange. Love love those singlets. Absolutely loved them. Couldn't stop talking about how cool they were. And same thing. I was reading some forums or something where everyone was talking about how terrible they were and how there was just too much going on. They like the simple orange Oklahoma State, which I mean, yeah, a lot of those simple singlets are classic. But I mean, I I like the designs. I like the flashy stuff sometimes. It's good to have a mix of both. And the second thing I'll say, so yeah, you, you can't please everyone with those. Second no. thing I was going to say something about, oh, the other thing I was going to say, um, so in high school, you don't realize this as a high school wrestler or maybe even as a parent or, or an adult, but in high school, you remember when we were at like states, we could wear whatever single that we wanted. I, I went to Cumberland Valley. We literally have, we're probably second to east, second or third to Easton and Northampton that I can think of off the top of my head. For the, just the sheer amount of singlets that we have a collection I, from. We had, I don't know, man. We had a lot. In, in AAA, at least I'm talking about. I mean, we yeah, had probably yeah, like 30 have singlets. Seen, yeah, because you wouldn't have seen all of them. Yeah, yeah. I, we probably had 30 singlets, and we could just pick whatever we wanted. If I wanted to wear the same singlet all four rounds at, at Hershey, then I would do it. Or I mean, I shouldn't really say all four because that only happened one time. But um, you get the point. Uh, in college, it's a, it's a rule – that you have your whole team has to be matching. So whatever single your one twenty five pounder wears in the first round of NCAs, that's what the whole rest of the team is wearing. Um, that's something I didn't know. I just thought you got to pick whatever single you wanted. But that is kind of a swag killer, in my opinion. But it, that's well, the rule, and that's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. So it was always kind of funny when we would. Uh, so it's for the entire round, right? So say the Friday morning session of NCAA's. For that round, whichever, you know, for us, whichever Lehigh guy went out first, was the first one to step on the mat, you better be wearing the same singlet as him. Yep. For the entirety of the round. So I think so, you get like a team point deducted or something. I think it's a warning then a team point every, yeah. every time after that. But th- so the game for us, and you got, you know, for all the great things that Darian, does, Darian Cruz does, he can be a little bit absent minded sometimes. And we were always paranoid because he did, you know, him and uh, both Cruz brothers, him and Randy were both guilty of this. Every so often they would forget something. And we were always worried about, at least I always was, because, I, you know, I wasn't going to have the time. It's not like, you know, Nate Brown who would have had the time. If Darian walked out in a singlet that he didn't expect, he'd go, oh, okay, he can just walk back and change, right? You know, I was on deck. So <laughs> before every round, we always – you know, when Santoro and Hughes and everybody would bring us in as a team, because, hey, what singlet are you wearing? And Darian would have to physically show us the singlet and go, okay, everybody got that on. Yes. Okay. We're good. <laughs> so, yeah, that is, that's definitely one of the lesser known rules for, for fans. So if you ever wonder why teams wear the same singlet across the board, that's why. And I think it makes sense, honestly, because for that round, it makes it easier for fans to identify the kids. Yeah, it does. I mean, some of those college teams even have a lot of different singlets. Like we were just talking about Edinburgh. If you got – and we're about to talk about Edinburgh right here in the coming moments. Seven returning national qualifiers. If you got seven guys at the national tournament for Edinburgh and every single one of them is wearing a different singlet, and shoot, some of them are red and white and some of them are camo green, it makes it a lot harder for the fans up in the nosebleeds to determine who is who and what mat. So it does make sense. Yeah, and I my guess would be that's the thought process behind it. All right, and now welcoming on to the show, a Pennsylvania wrestling legend. He was a state champ for Belfont High School, a three-time All-American for Edinburgh University, two-time national finalist, current assistant coach at Edinburgh at his alma mater, Mitchell Port. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. So, you know, like I just said, you've spent the better part of the last decade up up there and uh, up in Edinburgh. Um, you know, I guess the first question would be transitioning from 
being an athlete to being a coach, you know, that you never left Edinburgh. What was that transition like, you know, going from being teammates with guys to then being one of their coaches? And um, what are kind of the differences between just in general being an athlete and being a coach that you've kind of had to navigate? Yeah, the first first year, I guess two years, was um, a little challenging, figuring stuff out. I was friends with the guys before, and now I'm coaching them. I think it helped that I was one of the kids that were doing the right things and stuff transitioning over so it was never a problem whenever I said something it's usually listened to um, taken pretty well um, but as I'm getting older there's new guys coming in and it's starting to become different now because they're not as much my friend um, they're more of I guess they're younger they're I guess I'm just getting a little older and kind of growing up and seeing things differently but it's been good really really enjoy it yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I know that um, you know we all have friends or know somebody who's gone through that same process, and it's always a learning process, I'm sure. Um, so, how are things going up there? You know, I know you guys um, had a little bit of a transition period, and as a program from that class of yours when you guys graduated to where you're at right now, but it seems like you guys are in a good position for the coming season. Yeah, so first year I was coaching, it was a little bit, um, it was challenging. We still had some really good guys though. And we were getting some really good guys now and they're getting a lot better. But the first year we were, we weren't the same team that we were the year before we lost AJ and Dave and Corey Mines, And we lost a bunch of people. Um, but that's just part of it. I mean, you find new guys to, to do the job. And so far we've done a really good job of, of finding those guys and they're growing into the people that, that we're going to need. And, rely on for uh, I guess all Americans and hopefully some, some titles here soon. Um, but it it's up and down, but things are going good. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned that departure of your class. Um is that ever something that when you talk to these kids, the guys that are on the team now and everything, I'm sure that your experiences and your time at Edinburgh, you know, it's not like you did what you did somewhere else. You did, you know, you made two national finals. You put yourself in in a position to compete for a national title with exactly the same resources as what these kids have. Do you think that helps when, you know, trying to help guide these kids through your guys' program and help them kind of point, help point them in the right direction with living their lives and their training process? Yeah, I mean, Edinburgh is a great place to get get the job done if you really like wrestling it'll, it'll fit in well wrestle a lot train a lot uh, and there's no secret to it it's a lot of hard work that you don't want to do it it's going to be really hard to get there but uh, yeah it's no different I mean I think the guys on the team now they're starting to see that um, what they have to do and things they have to do differently to, to get there um, we had a couple guys that didn't get there last year and um they're putting the time in. They'll they'll figure it out here in the next year or so. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. But yeah, it, it'll it'll work out. I mean, it, it always does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and one of the biggest things that you guys have had to deal with this summer, obviously, was uh, Pat Lugo leaving. You know kind of talk a little bit about that and not necessarily the backstory to it because at least I personally don't think that type of stuff should be all that public, but just the process of moving forward, you know, with your lineup and kind of replacing him and, you know, a guy that was a point scorer for the national tournament. Yeah. It, it, it'll affect us a little bit. Not hopefully not a ton. Um, never want to think that way and negative about it, but, we're going to find another guy and we're going to have someone step on the mat in that weight class and hopefully we get the best guy that we can that can do some damage at uh, dual meets, I guess, a conference tournament and then hopefully at nationals as well. Uh, some talented guys coming in too that we're pretty high up on in that area. Um, so we'll have a guy step out there and we'll put the best guy out there that we can. So that's how we're going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's all you ever can do, right? Yeah. So, 
going back to when you came to Edinburgh, you know, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, when that class of yours came in with you, AJ, Dave, all of you guys, and you know, Corey Mines, all of you guys were on one level or another, you know, I think you'd all won state titles. Um, you know, you were all guys that had high expectations, I know, of yourselves and just from knowing each other, the things that each one of you had done, I'm sure of one another. At what point kind of in your guys journey together, did you realize or really decide that a team trophy was possible? Um, I don't know when exactly we started even thinking about it. It's always a goal. Um, I remember Flynn always told us, Hey, we get five guys to win the nationals. We're going to be hard to beat. Um, and, we had four guys and Corey was around to 12 that year. Um, and if we would all won, it probably would have been hard to beat. Um, so it was always in our mind that, that we were, we wanted to win. We didn't want to take third or third grade, but our goal as a team was we wanted to get the trophy and then we wanted to win. So that, that was just something that was in our, in our head pretty early. Um, I don't know if we ever thought about anything other than that. I and mean, we all wanted to do well for ourselves, but. There was a definitely team aspect to it um, from from the start. So, and I don't know if we knew how special it was when we first got there. I mean, kids go to school and they sometimes they don't pan out. We had a lot of guys with some high school credentials coming in, but um, we all we all seemed to do really well in that wrestling environment at Edinburgh and in nationals and all those other things. Yeah, and you know, I'll never forget, um, at the end of your guys' first year on campus, I think you all redshirted together that first year, right? Yeah, we did. And our district duels um, were actually up at Edinburgh every year. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you remember that. And yeah, we used to watch those. Just, you know, get having been up there so much from the district duels and, you know, just being around, I got to know Coach Flynn a little bit. And I remember talking to him just kind of talking about, you know, this, that, and the other thing after the district duels my senior year. And I'll never forget how excited he was about that class of your guys. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me was, you know, because you guys aren't a program, you know, with all the advantages that some of these bigger ones, that even the stuff that I experienced at Lehigh, you know, that these big programs have, that these bigger schools have. And the way he put it, he's like, you know, when we bring guys in, we can't miss. You know, if for Edinburgh to compete for a title, you know, with a class like yours, he brought you guys in and none of you guys, like you said, were guys that came out of high school with a lot of accolades and then just didn't pan out, right? None of you guys were recruits that missed. And I remember even just a year in Coach Flynn talking about how excited he was. He's like, I think we hit the nail on the head with this class. Yeah, our our class, that group that we had, man, it was it was fun to be around and and I think we're getting back to maybe not the class, but we have a group of guys now that are pretty similar um, in their training, in their in their outside life, their competitiveness, their their drive to really want to do well. So um, I'm excited to see what happens with the guys we have now that that are coming up. I hope that they can do better than than what my class did. I'd love to do that. Hopefully, I'm sitting in the corner while it's happening and be cheering them on. So, but that, yeah, that's that's something that we look for. We don't we try to find the right guy that's gonna that's gonna come in and enjoy what he's doing, enjoy where he's at. Just hopefully everything meshes well and the kid sticks out and does really well. So those are the kind of guys that we hope to get all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So, you know, in your time competing, was there really for just you personally? Obviously, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time and um, you know, we even wrestled each other once upon a time. I know that, you know, winning a national title was always something that you had in your head. That was always a goal of yours. Was there ever really one point in time because I know there was in my career? You know, ever really one point in time where you looked up and realized that it was something like, hey, this is something I can really, truly do. You know what I mean? Like the chips are falling where they need to. 
I mean, I'll say my sophomore year, um, I guess it would be my third year in school, um, really the first time that I I felt like I was right there. And I wrestled um, Maple and Steve earlier in the year, and they, they beat me up they, by quite a few points. And I remember being mad. At, um, I don't remember why I was mad, but I think it was more because I knew that I could compete with those guys. And those were the guys that um, had won it and done stuff at nationals a year before. Um, and they were ranked, I think first and second that year. So that was really the first year that I, I kind of felt that I was, I belonged there. Um, and I had to make sure that I stayed there, did everything I could to, to belong there. But that was probably the first time I, I felt that. So. Yeah. You think there's any, like you have any specific, not even just in your time at Edinburgh throughout, throughout your career. Any wins, moments, whatever they were, things that just kind of stand out when you look back on it, you know, when you look back on your time competing? Yeah, definitely the semifinals match my sophomore year stands out to me. Um, that was against Hunter Stever. He beat me up earlier in the year. And that was one uh, that, I don't know, Just that was the first time I probably ever expressed a ton of emotion in a match um, after winning. So, and that was a that was a breakthrough for me at All American. That was my goal to start. Uh, obviously, I wanted to win, but at All American, so that was kind of the first time that happened. That was kind of relief. And then I, I had to get as high as I could, and that was kind of the big match that I wasn't necessarily supposed to win. Kind of knock it out, I guess. That one, and then there's a couple in high school that obviously the one I won state uh, my senior year, and. Then I actually won uh, King of the Mountain tournament at Central Mountain my junior year. I wrestled Shane Young. Uh, he was on like a hundred win streak. So those are some looking back further. Uh, and then probably one of the funner matches I wrestled was my senior year against Ben Carter. It was, I mean, there were so many attacks and no one could score. It felt like uh, but that match was that was crazy. If I wasn't on hundred percent there I would have lost but I, everything was working in my way and stuff so those are some of the matches that, that stand out yeah and it's funny um a lot of those matches especially the high school ones are the ones that I remember because I was actually in that same um you know you and Shane took first in that king of the mountain bracket and I was third I got beat in the quarters on the other side and wrestled the whole way back through and I remember sitting there because Shane Young at the time was, I mean, you remember he was king of everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I remember what a big deal that match was. I remember you wrestled Carter at Powerade, right? That's another one. Yeah. That one, that was a huge match, actually. I was, I think I was the four seat there. And I, I didn't understand why I was. Um, I beat the kids that were two and three, I think. But, yeah, we met up in the semifinals, I believe. Um, and that was, that was one that everything was firing my way again. It was, everything was, everything I did was working. So. Yeah, I remember, I remember hearing about that. Um, and, you know, to those of us that knew you, it wasn't a thing that came as a huge surprise, but that was kind of your, with everything that Carter had already done, you know, winning that match, obviously you know, changes the way people, you know, national rankings and all those other things. Yeah. Um, it I think he beat me earlier that year too. Oh, I didn't at know Humber that. At, at Super 32, he might've beat me too. So that was actually one that I, I got back. That was, that was nice. Yeah. Those are always nice. Um, yeah. It's kind of funny looking back through some of the brackets that you're wrestling in high school, right? You know, like think about a match with between you and Carter. It's not often in uh, in high school you find two guys that hit that go on to be Division One national finalists or um, the first King of the Mountain bracket that you, we were all in. It was my freshman year when you beat me in the semis. You, me, and AJ were all in that bracket, all guys that were multiple time Division One All Americans, and none of us won that weight. <laughs> Yeah, that was a really good bracket that year. Uh, there's some other guys in there that wrestled Division One too, I believe, that well, were 
I mean, Shane. Really good. Yeah, Shane qualified for nationals, I think, all four years. And I don't remember who else was in that weight, but like you said, that was that was a good bracket. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of the last thing I was curious about, when you finished up at Edinburgh, you know, when you graduated and everything, what was the process like? Was it kind of set in stone? Did you really have a good idea, like, this is where I'm staying, you know, this is really where I want to be? Or um, what was the process like of ending up going from the mat to the corner? Um, it was different. I mean, I got a couple calls from places that um, some to wrestle, some to be director of operations, some to code. Uh, but it kind of worked out. I to stay at Edinburgh, I had to be a volunteer the first whenever I first committed to them and said I was staying around. Uh, and then I think it was two months later, the Colt Sponseller, he was the second assistant. He actually got a new job out in Ohio. Uh, so I kind of moved up pretty quickly in it. And it worked out really well, uh, but at the time it wasn't set in stone. I don't, I don't think they had it planned out. They might have, um, but they wanted to make sure that they could make it happen for me. Uh, so I, I checked out some places and things. I talked to Flynn a lot about it. On just if I wanted to coach, what I had to do. If I wanted to wrestle, what I had to do. If I wanted to go get a job, what I had to do. But I pretty much knew I wanted. To I wasn't into competing right away out of that. I was, I had to lose a lot of weight and I was a lot of stress and all my body and stuff. Um, so I, I kind of knew what I wanted to do and he thought the best thing out of the gate was to get into coaching if that's what I really wanted to do in the long run. So it worked out and, um, it's still working out too. Going well. Well, good deal. Um, you know, Tristan couldn't make it for uh for this call. He got hung up with some things, but he just he wanted me to tell you, by the way, that when we were all on that team at the Disney Duels all those years ago, he'll never forget you weighing 145, wrestling 112. That is a true story. <laughs> that yeah, was... I was. Well, I was hanging out with uh, I believe Joey, and you might have been in our room. I th- yeah, because sure. yeah, it was like me, you, Joey, Tristan. We had that huge room that was like split into two sides. Yeah. Yeah, I I gained a lot of weight after that. I don't I don't remember which year it was. It might have been our junior year, my junior year, I don't know. But that was that was probably one of the worst times that I've ever had after weigh in or anything like that. But I my mom actually heard that said that I was blobbing on everyone down there and squishing everybody or something. yeah i remember because i was 103 and you were 112 and we both cut so much weight for that team and i remember i I forget what duel it was but at one point somebody walked up and was like oh do you guys not have a 103 pounder (laughs) and we're like no i'm like that's me like oh who's your 112 and i pointed at you and the kid just was like you gotta be kidding me and walked away (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah that was that probably wasn't the smartest no no that was looking back on it I wasn't we had a good time though it was fun that was fun we had a good team too yeah um but hey man before, yeah like, go ahead. no what were you gonna say I think you wrestled with uh, Diesel and a couple of those teams maybe to play yeah we um, I, I know I'm we I'm not positive I know we placed. I don't remember who we lost to. I know we wrestled Mawa, I think, twice. Yeah, we did. I wrestled AJ. One yeah. and one. I was going to say, because the first match was when you still didn't feel good after weigh-ins. Um, and I then, know. I think he hit me in the cradle. And I, was, I don't know if I got pinned or not, but I remember I felt like we laid there for like three minutes on my back. I couldn't do anything. Yeah, that that's something AJ would do. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then we wrestled them again. I think they were like our last match. Yep. Uh, um, but no, you know, the last thing, you know, before I let you go here is uh, for any of those kids, parents, whoever, you know, listening out there, 
you know, that might be interested in Edinburgh or, you know, or looking at schools, at, you know, looking to wrestle division one, you know, what would you want, you know, just what would you want to say to them about everything you guys have going on as a program, as a university up at Edinburgh? I think that we're really starting to turn the corner on, on a lot of things. Um, we're obviously have a lot of support up there. Our athletic directors respond to our authority. President of USA Wrestling, won four Olympic medals. That guy was around wrestling for a really long time, still is. And then our coaching staff, I mean, Cliff Moore, he's the other assistant. He won national, he won a national title out in Iowa. Wayne wrestled at Penn State and all American. We have guys that have been through, through a lot of stuff and, and know what you have to do. And I think it's really a great place for someone that, that really wants to achieve their goals. And yeah, that was one of the reasons I went there. Yeah, and you know I can definitely double down on because I, you know, I grew up an hour south of Edinburgh, and I've wrestled in that gym. I've been to big dual meets in that gym, and I can definitely say if it if you're a kid that wants to go to a program that care a university that cares about wrestling, Edinburgh is as good a place as anywhere. Um, you know they pack Macomb Fieldhouse for those dual meets. You know, you get the wrestle teams like Iowa and Oklahoma State in Macomb Fieldhouse. So it's I, I can definitely piggyback on that and say that Edinburgh, you're absolutely right. You know, you're not just trying to sell something that's not there. It's it's wrestling country. There's no other way to put it. Yeah. Wouldn't feel something great here and we're I'm actually really fortunate to be a part of it right now and back then. So that's it. All right. Well, good deal, man. Um, you know, thank you for coming on. You know, can't can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Um, taking time out of your schedule up there and shaping things up for this coming season. So, thank you again. Um, good luck. Obviously, you know, we'll we'll see you around as the season rolls on. Yeah, I'll see you around. All right. Take Thanks it for easy. Having man. Me. Absolutely, man. Yep, take it we'll easy. So we've talked a lot about Edinburgh already so far with their singlets and with Lugo leaving the program to go for Iowa, to go to Iowa. So, you know, that, that leads us right into that's the team that we've chosen a preview for this week's episode. So Edinburgh 2017, Sean Russell returning All-American, Corbin Myers, uh, Schofstall, Gear, Billy Miller, Austin Matthews, um, you know, you got a really, really solid team coming back. Even with the loss of Pat Lugo, you've got a really solid team. You've got very legitimate All-American contenders, in my mind, for this coming season. Obviously, Sean Russell. Austin Matthews is a guy, one of the most dangerous kids in college wrestling. If you've never seen him wrestle, do yourself a favor. Go look him up on Flow Wrestling. You know, If you get a chance to see him live, he is... There's never a dull moment when Austin wrestles. That kid... And no matter who he's wrestling, it's going to be like two dudes in a clothes dryer for seven minutes. Yeah, um, Matthews has been so close. I mean, I don't know how close he's actually physically gotten to being on the podium at NCAs, but I know he's been there a couple times. He was even in my bracket once. I almost wrestled him when I was down at 157 my junior year. And, you know, those years that maybe he didn't get close to the podium, but he was ranked high enough most of the season that he was a contender for all Americans. So he's been close in that sense for multiple times and he's got one more shot. So really hoping to see Austin Matthews get on the podium this year. Um, at, now up at 165, like you said. Yeah. And we mentioned earlier about guys that have dealt with things that maybe people don't know. Austin started a clarion originally transferred to Edinburgh. Um, you know, felt like it was a better fit for him, but he's a guy that has dealt with issues with his knee, with getting it, getting it fixed, and then it got infected with staff, and it's just been a very long and arduous process of getting him healthy. Is that a staying. trend for Edinburgh 165-pounders to get staff infections in their knees? That's I don't know. we talked about. Maybe he's going to win a national title this year. Maybe, I was just going to uh, say. Yeah, maybe it's a it's a good thing, blessing in disguise. I'll tell you what, if, uh, if you know, Matthews I'll, does win the national title this year, I'm going to be the first one to break that uh, – that breaking news correlation on Twitter. I'm, I'm going to tell you that right now. Just you might as well write that tweet up, save it in your drafts, and just have have it. I'm ready, doing it as we speak, brother. Ready to pull the trigger on it when the time comes. I mean, obviously, I would be excited beyond words if Austin did, 
you know, make a run and win a national title. That's a kid that he grew up 200 yards down the street from me. You know, one of my best friends. So, again, legitimate All-American contenders in Sean Russell, Austin Matthews. Corbin Myers is a guy at 133 that, all, you know, he's a national qualifier, as we mentioned, and he just always wrestles guys tough. Corbin Myers, he won a state title in high school and, and you know, was dominant in his state title run, if I remember right. You know, Boiling Springs native down right by you guys uh, there in yep. Cumberland Valley. So Ten minutes down the road, yep. Big fan of Corbin Myers. We talked about him in our 133 preview. Great kid uh, off the mat too, but yeah, he um, – Two and two, I think he went in NCAs this year, maybe one and two. Had a pretty tough draw. I think he ran into Tomasello in the first round, oh. who, who may be dropping to 25, I saw a rumor. I'm not sure if that's true or not. but Yeah, I think uh, I saw that's like been confirmed. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, there's another guy gone at 133, but Corbin Myers, yeah. And then we talked about Dakota Gear, kind of in the same light. Another freshman this year for Edinburgh, true freshman. 184, went two and two also, I think, at the national tournament. So both those guys, you know, you have to think there's a couple seniors at least at each of those weights that have graduated. Those two will shift up in the rankings. We'll probably be looking at uh, you know, anywhere from 12 to 15 coming in next year to start the season in the national rankings. So contenders right there. Uh, looks All like right, they yes. just released their schedule too. Yeah, so they did just release their schedule with notable dual meets. They wrestle at Lehigh, so there should be some fun matchups in that one. You know, at 65, you could see Matthews, and I would assume for Lehigh, Cutler's probably going to move up to 65. So that, complete contrast in styles. Cutler's a guy who, you know, pure position wrestler in Austin, makes a living on scramble. So that could be a fun one. Yeah, and and just keep going down the list. Oklahoma State, Chandler Rogers. I think he caught and pin, pinned Chandler Rogers in the duel this year in a crazy – Crazy move. I don't even remember what he did. You probably remember that better than I do. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about two dudes in a clothes dryer, Austin Matthews, Chad Walsh. Every time they wrestle, it is absolutely bonkers. Yeah, and and just keep going down the list. Oklahoma State, Chandler Rogers. I think he caught and pin, pinned Chandler Rogers in the duel this year in a crazy, crazy move. I don't even remember what he did. You probably remember that better than I do. It, no, it wasn't even a scramble thing. Like he was just riding like a on suck him. back or something. No, I just cradled him and stuck him. Cradled him. That's right. Uh, but that's Austin. From the time he was a young kid, has been uh, the kid. If he gets his hands locked on a cradle, it's lights out kind of thing. And just riding him hard. And I think Rogers kind of turned the wrong way one time, and his hands got locked, and that was all she wrote. Yeah. Well, aside from just Matthews matchups, there. That's Lehigh, Virginia Tech, Ryder, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. And then the EWL tournament is at Edinburgh this year as well. So those are kind of the highlights of their schedule for this upcoming season. But like we said, six, at least six returning NCAA qualifiers. Could have been seven with Lugo, but Edinburgh still going to be a very, very tough team next year. Yeah, and they're a team that always, you know, Coach Flynn does an incredible job. A program that's not even fully funded. They, they're the only Division One program at Edinburgh. It's really – it's a pretty incredible thing that they do up there. You know, that coaching staff with Flynn, Cliff Moore, Mitchell Port, and um, – oh, the goodness, the name of their volunteer coach escapes me right now. But with the staff that they you – know, they have an outstanding staff, and they just continue to produce high-level guys. You know, quietly they go about their business. All right, and I think that's pretty much going to wrap it up for us today. You know, everybody that joined us, thank you for once again riding along on all of our ramblings. I hope at least some of it made sense. It did in our heads. Hopefully it did in your ears. As always, anything we missed, hit us up on Twitter. Let us know any anything we may have missed or any topics that you want us to talk about moving forward. You know, we're always happy to take uh, the Internet version of listener you know call in tweet us facebook us whatever it may be let us know but more than anything we want to thank mitchell port for coming on thank you guys for listening continue to support you know just keep spreading the word not just for this podcast with jeff and eric's and with all the pa power wrestling and you know with that tristan take us out it's funny you said that mason i was just gonna say uh we appreciate the fans who listened through some of the weird stories we told in this episode and some of the tangents and sidetracks we went on but 
Like you said, that's going to wrap it up for us here at the PA Power College Podcast. Thanks for dialing in. As always, I'm Tristan Warner. Find me on Twitter at WarnTriz. And Mason Beckman is at Beck underscore Diggity. Fans, you can visit PAPowerWrestling.com for all your wrestling needs. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at PA Power Wrestle and go ahead and give us a friend request on Facebook. Until next time, stay classy, wrestling fans.